Lessons from the Ecumenical Movement on Unity and Diversity From its earliest days, the Jesus Movement and then Christianity were faced with a one-for-many dilemma. Jesus lived and died in occupied Roman Palestine. But Jews who believed Jesus was God's promised one lived all over the empire. Paul and probably other itinerant evangelists for Jesus' way went to Roman cities, found the synagogue, and sought to persuade. Jesus communities formed in many places. One or more house churches of maybe up to 20 members sprung to life in each city. And as we can read in virtually every book of the New Testament, those small groups of Jesus followers did not agree with each other, either within their communities or from one community to the other. An evangelical New Testament scholar wrote that the creed, Jesus is Lord, is about as thick as any shared creed in the New Testament could be. The early Jesus communities were not idyllic islands of unity and peace. They were full of conflict, verged on and went over into division. Paul and the other writers would not have appealed for unity and peace so often if those experiences were abundant. If you extract conflict out of Paul's existing correspondence with the Corinthians, you'll hardly have enough words to make a sentence. Paul claimed true followers of Jesus were in Christ, which he considered a real spiritual reality. Christ's followers live in Jesus. God has fashioned them into a new being, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. And yet, we have four Gospels that tell some similar, some overlapping, and some completely different stories. Early Christianity was an effervescent pool bubbling with Jewish beliefs and practices, Zoroastrian influences, Greek philosophy, Roman mystery cults, Manichaean dualism, apocalyptic, apocalyptic hopes and fears, Gnosticism, and more. The reception of the Jesus movement differed by region. Conflict between church and synagogue moved to separation. The new religion was praised and cursed. It was banned, then it became legal, and at the end of the fourth century, the only legal religion in the empire. Effervescence and order vied for dominance. Christian communities in the East, in the West, in North Africa, in Egypt, and in India developed their own structures, authorities, and practices. The emperor's imposition of creeds slowed the fragmentation in the West, but only somewhat. East and West formally split in the 11th century, but that split had been coming for lifetimes. From the 6th century up through the modern era, Catholic orders of men or women religious, both laity and clergy, developed either to advance the mission of the church or correct its excesses and deficits. Crusaders tried to retake the Holy Land from Muslims, or at least keep knights from killing each other in Europe by sending them to holy wars elsewhere, and take out some ancient grievances upon the Orthodox East. Then comes the invention of the printing press, the age of discovery, that the world and its peoples, the opportunities for wealth and evangelism, were larger than Europeans thought. The development of capitalism, the maturing of universities, the challenges of secular authorities to the dominating power of the church and arise in a kind of nationalism. Western Christianity began its long period of splitting into branches. Catholicism, the Church of England, Reformed churches, Lutheran churches, the Radical Reformation churches that included Mennonites, Baptists, and others, responding to the gospel command to come out from among them and be separate. Now, take all these conflicts and now export them to the Americas and the nations of Africa. Oh, and let's see how many of our Christian heretical opponents we can kill on European battlefields while we're expanding our wars at home. Answer? Christians in Germany killed a third of the total population of their Christian opponents on both sides. Christianity has excelled at manyness, perhaps especially in the Protestant world. Oneness? There we've done best but still not well when imposed by an emperor or pope. 
In the late 19th century, some Christians tired of the battles, especially in mission fields. They began to experiment with cooperating rather than competing. In the late 19th century, the YMCA and Dwight Moody gathered youth from across the U.S. to ecumenical conferences. Missionary leaders called a missionary conference in 1910. Europeans and Americans began life and work gatherings to deliberate together about Christian ethics in a world after the war to end all wards scared the devil out of them. Others said, let's compare what we believe with each other and see where we might find common ground and not simply keep looking for how my faith family is different from your faith family. Then in the terrifying aftermath of atom bomb end of World War II, as the United Nations was forming, these leaders from missionary fields, ethics and society and faith formation were mostly Protestant with a few Orthodox said the churches must work together to help prevent a nuclear World War III. And so the Council of Nations, which is the UN, is mirrored by a Council of Churches, the World Council of Churches. However, going beyond the UN's imperative, the WCC was searching for the real unity of Christ's church and what must be surrendered to dissolve all the human-created divisions which frustrate God's will for a united church and a just and peaceful world. This world scene of the 1940s was driven by powerful centripetal forces. We must pull together for the sake of the survival of the human race. Except the we did not include people of color around the world in developing nations as equals with economically wealthy Western, predominantly white nations. The civil rights movement in the U.S. highlighted to the rest of the world a defect, perhaps a fatal defect, in American Christianity. The U.S. war in Vietnam further diminished the status on the world stages of not only America, but also American Christians. While Vatican II opened the Catholic Church to participate in the ecumenical movement and Catholics and Protestants marched together for racial justice and farm laborer rights, the women's movement divided Catholic from Protestant about as quickly as that dialogue opened. Developing nations freed themselves of colonialism and demanded an equal seat at the table. And there we are. Even though such issues as hunger, disease, and impending climate catastrophe might provide abundant centripetal energy today, centrifugal forces spinning ourselves away from each other increase. I cannot imagine Vatican II, the ecumenical movement, the United Nations, the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, or the Consultation on Church Union happening today. In like manner, I cannot imagine what would be birthed by a constitutional convention today. I hear the cries for councils of equals, for equitable representation everywhere. Who is at the table? Whose voices are there and whose voices should be there? Who can represent whom? But I hear little satisfaction with such councils in church or society as being sufficient. How do we achieve a one from many society? There must be a more or less agreed upon balance of ingredients, equality, freedom, and an understanding of how my freedom must be limited if I grant that you have the right to be as free as I am. I've come to believe that our oneness, whether the oneness of a religious congregation or the oneness of a nation, is founded upon three principles. And those principles do not include being of the same race, ethnicity, religion, language, or gender. First, we agree to play the same game. Second, we agree to play by the same rules. Third, we agree to stay at the table when the going gets tough. First, the same game. If one faction seeks illiberal minority control of a majority and another seeks to uphold liberal democracy with the majority recognizing minority rights, 
We're not playing the same game. One can't play football with a baseball or baseball with a badminton birdie. The game is expressed in the Declaration and the preamble to the Constitution. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, justice, peace, defense, general welfare, a more perfect union. Second, we agree to play by the same rules. The U.S. Constitution prior to the Civil War and Reconstruction, meaning prior to the 13th to the 15th Amendments, was a set of rules for a slave-holding white male republic. With those amendments and the 19th Amendment establishing women's suffrage, the Constitution is a very different set of rules from that pre-Civil War document. Originalist interpretations of the Constitution that diminish the importance of the Reconstruction Amendments result in different rules from when the courts recognize the full impact of those amendments. In addition, the Newt Gingrich rulebook for how to denigrate Democratic opponents and turn them into enemies of the Republic is a different rulebook than any before it in the Republican Party and different from political actors who assume that the rule book ought to spell out the art of compromise with our worthy opponents. Third, we agree to stay at the table when the going gets tough. When a couple comes to a therapist for relationship counseling, one of the critical first questions is, is this marriage counseling or divorce counseling? When one party believes the other is about to leave the table, what is risked would be much different than if each party believes the other wants to continue to live in the same household or city or state or nation. As I move toward the conclusion of these musings, I offer two resources. The first is a list of rules for ecumenical dialogue developed by the late Presbyterian theologian and ecumenical leader Robert McAfee Brown. These rules can be fruitfully adapted for secular dialogue, and I've updated his male language. Number one, each partner must believe the other is speaking in good faith and based on seeing each other as siblings, albeit maybe separated siblings. Two, each partner must have a clear understanding of their own faith. Three, each partner must strive for a clear understanding of the faith of the other. Corollaries to this rule are a willingness to interpret the faith of the other in its best rather than its worst light and maintain a continual willingness to revise their understanding of the faith of the other. Four, each partner must accept responsibility and humility and penitence for what their group has done and is doing to foster and perpetuate division. Five, each partner must forthrightly face the issues which cause separation, as well as those which create unity. And six, each partner must seek to make the dialogue a source of renewal in their own church. Playing by such rules for conversation and argument would enhance our ability to play by the rules at all. The second resource is this lovely, powerful poem by James Russell Lowell. He wrote the poem in 1845 as a protest against the Mexican-American War. He thought the U.S. had no business engaging that conflict. Many Christians will know the hymn, Once to Every Man and Nation, that is based on the poem. Hear Lowell's pleas to keep looking forward. We will not accomplish what we as a nation need to do simply by honoring the past. He uses the language of betraying our ancestors in order to meet the challenges of the present day. They have rights who dare maintain them we are traitors to our sires. Smothering in their holy ashes, freedom's new lit altar fires. Shall we make their creed our jailer? Shall we, in our haste to slay from the tombs of the old prophets, steal the funeral lamps away to light up the martyr faggots around the prophets of today? New occasions teach new duties. Time makes ancient good uncouth. They must upward still and onward who would keep abreast of truth. Lo, lo, before us gleam her campfires. We ourselves must pilgrims be, launch our Mayflower, 
and steer boldly through the desperate winter sea, nor attempt the future's portal with the past's blood-rusted key. It is that last line that just pierces me, nor attempt the future's portal with the past's blood-rusted key. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. America's original motto, our unfinished project. We will never finish this project, for there is no arrangement that can't be undone by good or bad actors. Someone will always seek to use public goods for private gain and to subvert we the people with I am the people. But the project of a E pluribus unum is supremely worthy of our attention. It will not happen without a certain quality of conversation, argument, public virtues, cultural and civic will, and vision. What do you think? Let's talk on Thursday and in the chat before then.